<laughs> it's nice to have feedback. <laughs> um, say hello to everybody in Sherman, and thank you for your patience in the snow and ice for coming out for here as well. Um, I'm going to hear, be here today to talk to you about uh, higher education, both in America and in the world. Um, this is a story in part about what happens when you take something that's invented in America to another country and try to translate it. It's also, frankly, a really cool story about my great year in Hong Kong, and I have an opportunity to show off some very cool photographs while I'm at it. Um, and a blonde wig. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is actually um, a story about the future of higher education and how I think we might be going down the wrong path and why this should matter to you and what you can do about it as well. So liberal arts education in the modern sense is really an American invention. European universities have become more specialized, more narrow in their training. American liberal arts institutions have continued to provide their students with broader curriculums, focusing on small interactive classes, critical thinking, and particularly training for good citizens, both American and global citizens, and also for leaders in this world. Now, I'm not the product of a liberal arts education. I went to three research universities, and so when I came to Austin College 20 years ago, I was a little uncertain of how this liberal arts thing worked. But I soon came to really appreciate the value of the interactive, interdisciplinary kind of conversations I have with both my students and with my colleagues as well. And I became to realize that these small schools could very much offer more opportunities for undergraduate students than even some of the largest state schools. So it was a good place to be, a good place to work, and a good place to teach. So in 2010, I had an amazing opportunity. I was awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to teach American history at Hong Kong Baptist University. This is one of the eight major government universities in Hong Kong, and they were undergoing a major educational reform effort during this period. So I need to give you a little bit of background about Hong Kong for those of you who are not as familiar with it. Hong Kong was a British colony for almost 100 years, and the British handed it back to the People's Republic of China in 1997. Now, the Chinese government promised Hong Kong that they would be able to continue to keep their own government and system of laws and financial system for the first 50 years. This is part of their basic law. But there was a lot of discussion about what a Hong Kong identity was going to be. How would Hong Kong remain competitive, being this sort of impending absorption um, by a larger country? And much of that discussion focused on education. So to talk about the education system in Hong Kong, it was a British-style education system, more of this European specialized one. And what that tended to mean was tracking. Students get tracked into ever narrower tracks as they go on through their education. So at age 14, they decide on a general specialty. Are they going to be in sciences? Are they going to be in business? Are they going to be in humanities? Then for um, they for at age 17, everybody takes a test to determine whether or not they get to go to university. And if they pass these tests, then for the next two years to prepare for university, they narrow it down to two or three subjects only that they study. So instead of sciences, it's just biology and geology, or just uh, history and literature. So they study these intently, and then at age 19, they take the actual qualifying exams to come to university. And at that point, they enter university from age 19 to 22 and study just one subject. A very specialized, very deep education. Now, at the same time, the government was thinking about the sort of education and what people needed for the future, what was going to be the best preparation. And they looked at the realities of the 21st century. And they recognized that in the 21st century, the problems we face, these are not problems that you can solve with simple statistical models. These are not problems that you can solve without a broader background of things. AIDS, climate change, poverty, these are not simple problems that have simple solutions. The other thing that they realized is that in the last 15 years, we've had a major revolution about knowledge. And this is as a result of the internet. 
any information is available to you at the click of a button or a fingertip. Um, it's not the information that we need to worry about. That is readily available to people. You don't have to go to a university to find this information. You can find it yourself. What you need is the ability to sort through these things. So they need critical thinking skills. So the government did a survey of all major world uh, leaders and in education, in business, in government, to think, see what they thought about Hong Kong students and their impressions. And what they said was, well, we think that Hong Kong students are very strong in quantitative skills and statistical skills, but a lot weaker in critical thinking and in creativity, the very things that were going to be necessary in the 21st century. So they said, we're going to do some research and rethink our education system if we want Hong Kong to remain competitive. And um, what they did after they searched all the best pedagogy and the latest technology and the latest ideas about education, what they decided was going to be the best preparation for their students was to inject portions of an American-style liberal arts education. Now, they decided they were going to revamp not only higher education, but also the secondary system. And that's the advantage of having the government control of both parts of these things, that you can do sweeping reforms of this nature that are not always possible. But what they said was, we're going to stop this tracking. All students will go to school to age 18. They won't have to choose any specialization before that area. Then they were going to take one of these years from the university, I mean, from the secondary schools and give it to the universities. And this would be creating a general education portion. This is where they put that broader curriculum, interactive classroom type activities into uh, the college education. So they mandated that all the universities had to create general education programs, usually in a foundational year, but not necessarily. They had to have three characteristics. They had to be interdisciplinary in nature. They couldn't just be an introductory course to the discipline. They had to involve interactive teaching. No more the professor stands and recites at the front and the students take notes, and then you take one giant test worth 80% of your grade at the end of the semester. That does not encourage critical thinking. And then it also had to be relevant to students' lives. This needs to be knowledge that you apply in the real world. So this is where I come in again. I became part of a Fulbright team of specialists focusing on helping to facilitate the development of this general education program. Most of us from liberal arts schools or liberal arts backgrounds, but all with this experience in general education. We gave workshops on how to design these kinds of courses, how to do engaged pedagogy teaching methods, and we spoke with administrators to try to help ease the way and see what we could do to do it. And we soon realized very quickly that this was not going to be a simple transplantation of the American system. In fact, China has its own form of liberal arts system in Confucian thought, because Confucius said that the best leaders are not just trained in government. They also know how to paint a picture or write a poem. And so they also had an intentionality about this program that we don't necessarily have in the United States yet that this is a new modern version of the best education could be. So there was a focus on the students from the start, deep learning instead of memorization, the best and latest technology um, to assist in the classroom. So I got very excited about all of this. For me, it was I learned as much as I taught while I was there, as did most of my colleagues. And I came home excited and refreshed, and I was also really happy to find that the colleagues at my school were having similar conversations about what does a modern liberal arts education look like. However, at the national level, the discussion was slightly different in higher education. The first thing is the financial concerns, and understandably given the recession, that financial concerns seem to take the lead. Universities are cutting programs simply to save money without regard to what role these departments are playing in the curriculum. The, uh, uh, President Obama has announced a scorecard recently for rating universities that's based on their graduation rate and on their tuition, but not upon the content of the curriculum and what the students are learning at these schools. 
Second trend is technology rules, and this is in part because of needing to save money. Uh, what has become very fashionable these days are these massive online open courses where you can have thousands of students pay to take a course, and one professor with some taped lectures, and it's online, and there's online grading programs. They are developing online um, technology to grade papers, so you don't need an expensive faculty member to do that. They have facial recognition technology, so the computer can tell if you don't understand an aspect of the uh, exercise, they can go back and repeat it for you. Okay. It's a little scary if you're a faculty member to be considered obsolete, expensive, but that's not really the only thing I'm concerned about. It's not just my job, and I wouldn't be a good liberal arts teacher if that was. Third trend is obviously that the curriculum is people are asking for is a narrow curriculum. We need more professional preparation. We need deeper preparation in our skills, those things. Now, I'm not denying that we don't need skills training. I'm not denying we need to completely, everybody should be having a liberal arts education. But I do think that this is the wrong education for the 21st century. What we need is a broad-based curriculum. You can't be successful in marketing these days if you don't understand diversity or global cultures or speak a foreign language. You can't be a successful artist if you don't understand business. We also need less content, not more content. Uh, there's enough content out there. The knowledge revolution is there. We can find this information. What we need desperately is to teach people how to evaluate the information that's there and what skills they can use. Lastly, we need to have good citizens and better leaders. We have a crisis of leadership in this country. Um, we have it in government and in business, perhaps in the military. If we get more women, we won't have this crisis <laughs> there either. Um, but uh, we have an opportunity here that to train people to emphasize um, good citizenship with the liberal arts style education that you can't get from a computer. You need interpersonal contact, you need mentors, you need this kind of contact that you can't get on a computer program. What does this mean for us? You know, if we're not careful in the future, we're gonna have Chinese experts coming to talk to us about the future of liberal arts, which we invented here. Um, it's not a good thing. So what can you do? What is the thing that you, what difference can you make? This is not a cheap model. Uh, education cannot really be a business model. And it's important to us because the people who uh, train our teachers are at university. So it's not just the universities that are being affected. It's the people who are teaching elementary school and secondary school. If they don't have this kind of a broad training, they won't understand the value of it or the necessity of it. They won't be able to teach in the same way that we want them to be able to teach to prepare our students. We also won't be able to um, you know, have students be flexible to change for the careers in the future. What we need, however, is more access to this kinds of education. So what you can do is write your congressman, write the state legislature, ask for them to continue support for funding for student loans, for Pell Grants, Texas Education Grants, the sorts of things that can make quality education more accessible. Write to the White House, ask them to consider the content of the curriculum as well as the cost of it, too. We need to work on together to find ways to bring the cost down, but we can't just focus on education as a business model. Thank you.